we start with you providing us a little bit about your background um, as we talk about achieving body peace? Yeah, so the reason that I'm so passionate about body peace is because I happen to be the expert on body war. And unfortunately, so many of us know what body war is, right? It's that feeling of my body's not okay. I can't believe I just ate that. Maybe I should eat something different tomorrow. Maybe I should start a new diet. Maybe I'm going to not eat whatever X, Y, and Z and start eating A, B, and C, right? Maybe I'll start the new plan that the latest book is about. And then that fails again on Thursday because we started on Monday and then we feel bad and then the eating becomes kind of wacky and feels out of control then we feel terrible and then we go again on Monday right that's the war and that was my life and I was always looking for the next fix the next greatest latest thing and so my personal journey of trying to feel at home in my body and feel Like, it's okay, I can have an easy relationship with food. I can look in the mirror and not hate my belly, my thighs, my chin, my whatever, right? Have that softer relationship with my body, not expect myself to conform to the ridiculous, perfect body beauty ideal that our culture has. And so in pursuit of that healing, I um, became a therapist and delved deeply into nutrition and then started to combine and weave those pieces together to create this work that I call body piece, which is really about helping women feel at home in their body and getting past that idea of like, I know all the things, right? I can write my own book on nutrition. I know all the things, why aren't I doing them? And so body piece is really about creating the practice of being in a positive, caring, respectful, supportive, good relationship with our own body. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think we, many of us know about that body war. Certainly I do. I've kind of had that, you know, my whole life and, and doing that work now to, to really come to a different relationship. So Um, maybe we can dig a little bit more into body peace. What are some of the roots in terms of like, why do we need this? You know, um, where does the war come from? Maybe we can just expand on it. Yeah, absolutely. So the reason that we really want to be practicing body peace actively, intentionally practicing body peace is because body war is coming at us fast and furious from our culture, right? What I actually call body management. We're always taught, oh, if you watch how many calories, how many grams, how many carbs, how many whatevers, then you'll be taking care of your body well and you will get that slim toned body that our magazines, our blogs, our Instagram, or whatever tells us that we're supposed to have. So the reason we want to be practicing a conscious relationship that's filled with care and kindness with our body is because we're being fed how to have a toxic relationship with our body every day, right? There's the constant like lose seven pounds in seven days. And all that is, is perpetuating this idea that our body's not okay and that we should be tightening our grip and getting a handle on our body and really working hard and tightening the reins, you know, pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and get to it, that whole concept. And then that's going to change it. And what we know actually from the research is 95% of people who go on diets gain their weight back, if not more weight, in two to five years, right? And we all know, or we have been, those people who are like, look at my before and after picture. But what you're seeing in those before and after pictures is actually weight cycling. You're seeing the, oh, great, I lost all the weight. 
But then what you don't see after two months, two years is all that weight came back on because really what I was in was a relationship of restriction. I was in a managerial top down, you know, hold on tight for dear life kind of relationship with my body. And we all know those relationships don't work. They feel terrible. Right? Yeah. And they can lead to or a partner. Yeah. Like dangerous things, right? Like that's where we, you know, can get into the eating disorder line and stuff. Cause you're trying so hard to keep that right. Like, yes, yes. Yeah. In fact, it's a really good point that you're bringing up, Sarah, which is this idea that actually dieting more than promoting weight loss promotes disordered eating and actually weight gain. So, you know, if you're listening to this, it's like, and thinking, oh, what might my next diet be? It's like, what am I promoting here? Am I actually promoting self-nourishment, right? self-compassion, truly being on my own side to feel vital and well, or am I continuing to promote disordered eating, obsessive thinking, and weight gain? Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of where I found myself uh, was like, you know, and I, I kept the weight off longer, but it was like, slowly creeping up over, you know, seven years or so. And then I sort of hit this like point of clarity where I was like, oh my gosh, I am like in eating disorder territory now to try to, and and then obsessive exercising to try to keep off that weight because I didn't want to fail so badly. Right. Um, And so I can definitely identify with that. And then, you know, you have to kind of get to that point. So what about if you're somebody who, has struggled forever with your weight and you're like, you feel like, okay, wait, what I'm hearing is that losing weight is almost hopeless, but I'm also not happy with my body. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Like people can kind of get in that mindset of like, well, now what? Everybody has sold me that being thin will make me happy. And you're saying that's not actually a thing. What, what do I do? (laughs) Right. Um, So what you're saying is so important and there's two ways that I want to answer it. One is we can want what we want. We can want to lose weight, right? We can also want to feel well. We can want to not be obsessed. We can want to not feel like we're not enough all the time, right? We can want, we can want a million dollars. We can want, you know, a penthouse apartment. We can want whatever we want. So I'm not saying that you can't want to change your body. You can want that. Our culture tells us all the time, that's a great thing to do. But let's get underneath what that desire is. And when you said, you know, but what if, you know, you do want to be in a smaller body? What if you do want to feel like you're taking better care of yourself? So let me tell you a story. I have a, a dear friend who I've known for 25 years. And we were out to dinner. And we were having Mexican dinner. And... And she knows exactly what I do. She knows I've been working with women for 30 years, helping them feel at home in their body, helping them get off the diet roller coaster, helping them claim their authentic relationship with their food and a trusting relationship with their body. She knows exactly what I do. And she said, yeah, but Nina, what if I want to lose weight? And I was like, okay, exactly. talk about this, <laughs> right? She's like, I get it. I get it. I'm all for trusting your body and listening to your body's wisdom. But how do I also you know, lose weight, and, right? Like that's what everybody. <laughs> but how do I also lose weight? Like, and I was like, great question. So let's talk about it. And I, you know, we we're sitting there in front of all our food, you know, our guacamole and our chips and our salsa. And, but I had a little empty plate in front of me. And I said, okay, let's put weight loss on this plate you want weight loss. She was like, yep, I do. I was like, great. Let's put that in front of me. That's what you want or in front of you. That's what you want. Here's the weight loss. She was like, great. And I was like, and if you get what's on that plate, the weight loss, what will happen? She said, I'll feel better about myself. I was like, great. Okay. Let's put feeling better about yourself on this plate, our guacamole plate. That's going to be you feeling better about yourself. Put the guacamole plate in front of the empty plate. 
I was like, and if you feel better about yourself, then what will happen? She's like, well, I think I, I would move more. It's like, great, let's put movement right after the guacamole plate. So we put a plate of chips in front of the guacamole plate that was in front of the empty plate, the diet, I'm gonna lose weight. I was like, okay, so now if you feel better about yourself and if you move, you start moving more, then what's going to happen? She's like, I think I would have a lot more energy. And I was like, great, let's take the salsa and we're going to put that. That's going to be our, I'll have more energy. I said, we could go keep going on and on about what's underneath this I want to lose weight plate. Now, the problem with this setup is in order to feel good about yourself, in order to start moving more and doing movement that you love, and in order to have more energy, you're saying first you have to get off of that plate of I want to lose weight. Now here's the problem about that plate. Nobody gets off of it. It goes around and around. That's our diet cycle, right? That's the, if you start dieting and restricting, your inner rebel's going to show up and you're going to start feeling like, oh my gosh, I feel out of control, right? That weight loss plate, just going for I need to lose weight, never ends because it's not effective. So if we say, okay, fine, I want to lose weight, but we're going to move that plate to the side, maybe to the back. In fact, we're going to put that plate back in the cabinet. Then what's in front? Oh, there's the guacamole plate. What was the guacamole plate? I would feel good about myself. Great. Let's work on that because that is something we can actually change. That is something we can actually impact. We can change how we feel in our body by unlearning the diet culture, by claiming our body as it is, by being kind, by developing self-compassion. Oh, now I'm feeling a little better about myself. Wow, now I'm out for a walk. Now I'm going to the gym or I'm doing whatever it is kind of movement that I love. Fantastic. I'm doing that. And now, wow, I have more energy. Now, likely, not everybody, but likely is our body's going to change in some way. When we start moving more, we start feeling better. We start being more active in our life, right? I'm not saying weight loss will happen, but our body will get stronger. We will have more energy. And ultimately, underneath the plate of weight loss, that's what we wanted. So we have to, if we want to feel good in our body, put that idea of I can have feeling good in my body if. We have to put the if and the plate to the side. No, I get to feel good in my body now. I get to support myself now. I get to nourish myself deeply now. I get to stop obsessing about food now. I get to start embracing movement as a joy of being in a human body instead of as a chore because I'm supposed to work off some calories, right? It's a whole different ball game. And then being thin isn't the prize. Feeling good is the prize. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And it's it's that real focus on self instead of, you know, the number or, um, the size or, or what have you, right? Like, um, it's kind of a a whole mindset shift. It sounds like it's even, it's, it is a mindset shift, but it's more than a mindset shift. People are like, Oh, I just need to change how I think about it, but it's actually a practice, right? Mm. Just like people practice yoga, right? And they get on the mat and every day it's a little different and their body's a little different. This is a practice. It's a relationship more than a mindset shift. When we're having a difficulty in a relationship, right? Whether it's a relationship with our partner or a kid or a parent or a friend, we don't go, you know, I just have to have a mindset shift. Mm -hmm. We don't because we know that it's not a switch that we can switch, right? That's when people, you know, sort of in my field go, you know, we just have to change how we think about it. It's not that. It's not like oh, just, you know, positive think your way out of it, right? That's why I, my, this work isn't called body love. Body love mm. is this aspirational, and then I'm going to love my body, and oh, every day I'm going to look in the mirror. And, mm, mm, mm. That's not real life, 
right? We all know if we've been in a relationship for more than a week with anybody, that's not how it shows up all the time, right? A real relationship has its ups and downs. And that's what we want to cultivate. That's what we want to practice is authentic relationship with our food and our body. And that's not just a mindset. There is for sure some unlearning, some unlearning around, oh, I'm, I'm good because I ate good food. I'm bad because I ate bad food. We definitely have some unlearning and some unpacking around all those messages and morality that goes with eating and food. And we want to step into a sense of, wait, how am I feeling? What do I need? What would nourish me? Right? That's relationship talk. That's how am I, hey, body, how are you doing today? What are you feeling? What are you needing? What would nourish you? How can I best support you? How can I be in service to you, body, instead of bossing you around and restricting you and being in that management tight, controlling experience because that feels terrible nobody wants that in any kind of relationship absolutely and so what are some of the things that people tend to run into in terms of challenges when they're trying to work on this relationship <laughs> the first thing the first thing that happens is they go oh so Nina says, and this is a big um, foundational concept in intuitive eating and starting to trust our body, is full permission to eat, right? When mm -hmm. we've been dieter dieters our whole life and suddenly like in intuitive eating or, you know, psychology of eating work, our body trust work, our body peace work, we go, oh, you know what? Let yourself have the foods you've been restricting there's this feeling of like yahoo i'm out of jail <laughs> like i get to eat everything but full permission to eat isn't i eat everything it's getting to choose what do i want what supports me best how am i serving myself in terms of feeding myself food that, that enlivens, that brings me pleasure. So that one of the places people often get a little bit hung up is they're like, oh, yay, full permission to eat. Now I'm just going to have bonbons from morning to night. But that's not full permission to eat. That's like get out of free, get out of jail free card eating, right? What mm. we want is actually a place of what I call compassionate eating, caring eating, right? Truly listening eating, responsive eating. Because so often we're in reactive eating. <gasps> I'm not getting it, so I better get this now. I'm not allowed this, so I'm just going to grab for this. I'm not, I shouldn't eat, shouldn't eat, shouldn't eat. Now I'm starving. My blood sugar is so low. Now I can't stop eating. Mm -hmm. That's all reactive eating. We want to be in a responsive relationship with our body. Okay, that makes sense. So, yes, it's a, a totally challenging first few steps, I'm imagining. <laughs> so how do you get somebody started then in terms of doing that? Right. So there's different ways. You know, we're all different learners. We all come from different places. So. Some people do, you know, well in terms of coming into this work, you know, doing individual work. Some people do really well coming into this work in a group. I have lots of groups, Body Peace Keepers, Body Peace Seekers. Um, and some people, and most people need to come into this work a little bit slowly because there's this sense of, I want, that we've all wanted most of our life, if we're dieters, I want the quick fix, right? Can I just switch the switch and like unplug my brain from all the obsession about what I just ate and, how, and my body and the fat rolls and the wrinkles and all of that stuff. But really what it is, is walking slowly towards yourself. Um, and there's some places that I think are really, um, 
powerful doorways. And one of them is um, on my website, which is a free body peace journal. It's called Practicing Body Peace. And in it are 20 questions that I would ask anyone if they were sitting with me in a session because they start to get into the conversation of, so what's happening with your relationship with your body? And what's the history of your relationship with your body? And what's the story of your body? And how do you feel about food? And where did you learn what you know about food and about size and about weight? What are the messages that got stuck in your head that you still are believing and telling yourself in the mirror that are no longer true and that do not support you? So that's a very powerful first step is to, you can go to my website, ninamanelson.com and there, or bodypeacewithnina.com, it's all one word, and you can find that journal and that will invite you into a conversation because that's what we want. And while you're doing that, the other thing to play with, and Sarah, if you're willing to try it, is such a simple thing, but very powerful, is put your hand on your heart, close your eyes, and say, hello, body. Hello, body. Because when we connect, oh, you, hello, body. And just notice what happens. Mm -hmm. What happens to tune in a little bit more, right? Like you're kind of start to tune into your own body and your needs and all of that. Which you're right, like our mind gets so far away from. (laughs) Right. Right. It's a different, we're, we're, we're shifting our focus from what's the right thing? What's the wrong thing? What's the good thing? What's the bad thing? What's the thing that's going to take off 30 pounds with one bite? Mm-hmm. What's the thing that's mm-hmm. going to put on 30 pounds with one bite, right? All the extreme black and white thinking that we have in our head. Hello, body goes, oh, wait, I'm in relationship with this powerful body. And she deserves my attention. She deserves my listening. And she deserves space and time to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's absolutely powerful. And I could see, you know, the journaling and, and stuff going along with some of those thoughts that are coming up as people go ahead and do that. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm wondering in terms of switching gears a little bit, if we are working on body acceptance and we have children, how can we start to pass on some of those more generous messages so that we're not passing on the diet culture and the you know, quest that I think many of us have been on our whole lives, right? Like, I'd love to see the next generation not have this. Are, is there any advice for for how to do that? Absolutely. There's so much hope for the next generation for a lot of reasons. One is there's a lot more representation of body types in the media right now than there were when I was growing up, right? Yeah, Probably sure. when you were growing yeah, up. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right? This, there was all like tiny humans in magazines. Mm-hmm. And now we have people of different sizes. So that's one really good thing. And we still have people who are airbrushing and putting filters on. Mm-hmm. And magazines that are literally changing people's bone structures and you know, airbrushing fat away. So one of the things, depending on the age of your kid, is to talk to them about how our media portrays women and what might be happening behind the scenes, right? Are they filtering this person? Have they changed that person's body, right? Uh, We want to, as parents, pull back the screen a little bit like, like like Wizard of Oz. Who's behind there? What are they doing? They're creating an image 
that is so unrealistic for most of us to live into. So that's one. That's sort of on the big media end of things in terms of allowing them to be discerning around the images that they are digesting. Inviting them to question, hmm, do you think that's what she really looks like? Or how much do you think they tweak that image? We want to train our kids to think that way. The other thing that's so important, because I work with so many women who come into my office, come into sessions with me, come into groups with me, and say, you know, I learned how to hate my body from my mother, who was like, oh, don't eat that, and who was chronically on a diet, and who Mm -hmm. even in her 80s or 90s is still feeling like she's too fat, right? We want to be modeling a sense of this is my body. We don't have to be, again, we don't have to be in body love. We don't have to be like, this is the best body, the most beautiful body known to mankind. We don't have to be false if we don't feel that way. But we can be incredibly neutral. Here's a body and there's another body and bodies come in all shapes and sizes, right? And that's your body. And all bodies are worthy and all bodies are lovable. And by being a model of real body acceptance, and if you can't get to body acceptance, body neutrality, oh yeah, here's my body today. Mm -hmm. There it is. So very important to be the model of your body is a good body. All bodies are a good body. Yeah, I really like that because I think, you know, growing up, I certainly saw the diet cycle with, you know, my mom, with my aunts, all of that. It was always kind of that conversation of who's on what, who's doing what, here's the latest book kind of thing. Um, And so Mm -hmm. it did really normalize it. Like it seemed like, well, of course, everybody's worried about that as they get older, you know, like that's what everybody has to do. Um, And so I like that focus though on, you know, if you're not quite there, you could even just be neutral, right? Like just not, not promoting the other side of it. um, And, and try to just be as, you know, plain about as you can, because it is hard, like, you know, as a mom, you're, you're a human as well, right? Like, you know, that there are things you're working on, and you're not perfect. And you maybe don't have um, the relationship that you'd like to have, right. And and so even if you pull it back and say, okay, but you could, you know, not be encouraging of the diet culture and, and sort of the disordered eating and, and things like that. Um, it's so challenging too. I mean, there's always new things coming up. Um, fasting is kind of one that's um, really taken hold and, you know, it's, it's a challenging one to, to work with yeah. as well. Cause for me, it was very eating disorder triggering. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> <It is>. exactly. <laughs> My line, I, there's a line that I often, I say at least once a week to somebody Humans require food. You mm-hmm. are a human. Therefore, you require food. Yeah. That's a reality. We require food. And I want to reel back to something you said that was really important, Sarah, which is this idea of the, how it becomes so normal that everybody's mm-hmm. talking about diets. Yeah. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, what are you not eating? Oh, what about this? And to really call out that diet talk, oh, and to your kids, even if you can't say it in front of the people who are talking about it, you walk away and say, wow, that was a lot of diet talk. Mm. And that is such a trap that our culture gets into mm-hmm. around thinking that that's important. Imagine if all those smart women were just together, were talking about climate change. Don't you mm-hmm. think life would be different if we put all our energy towards things that really matter in our world? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Really no, I agree. Great naming the diet talk, calling it out. And the other thing that can be very helpful, both for mom and for kids, is getting off the scale, not right. having the scale. In fact, going to the doctor and saying, we don't weigh ourselves. And I know people are like, ah. 
but we don't need to. It's actually not the most important marker of health. Mm -hmm. right? I, Sarah, I think I mentioned to you that I write body poems, mm -hmm. uh, body peace poems. And one of the poems um, that I wrote is called Please Don't Weigh Me. I'm wondering if I can read that. Yeah, here. yeah, absolutely. So it's called Please Don't Weigh Me. She asked me to hop on the scale. I said, no, thank you. She said, we'd like to get a baseline for your health since you're a new patient. I said, I don't subscribe to the belief that weight determines health. There are more powerful metrics that paint a picture of my vitality. Another day, she asked me to hop on the scale. I said, no, thank you. She said, we're a surgical practice and we need to, your weight to determine anesthesia dosages. I said, of course, if I need to have the surgery, I'll get on the scale. But right now, we're just having a conversation about the possibility of surgery, not actually prepping for it. Mm. Another day, she asked my daughter to hop on the scale. I said, no, thank you. We don't weigh ourselves. I know that your mission is to support healing, but your scale and you weighing my daughter is not healing. It's harmful. It buys into the diet culture's message that thin is better, that there is a specific number that we're aiming for. Your scale interrupts my daughter's ability to trust her body. Your measurements have her measuring her self-worth against a number. I am fighting for my ability to listen to my own body cues. I am desperately trying to defend my daughter from the impact of a culture that values a particular size over substance. I am advocating for women to have a relationship with their body that is based on internal cues, not external numbers. Given my history of dieting and scale addiction, if you weigh me now, you will be doing harm to my mental health instead of supporting my overall health. So please, don't weigh me. Yeah, that's very nice. That's, that's great. Very to the point. And I've heard so many people talk about this, that, you know, it can be so challenging to, you know, you're trying not to do that. And you go into a doctor's office, and it's like, oh, my gosh, now what? And I've heard some things about maybe turn your back to the weight even like, um, but yeah, just the whole practice. I think that's a really powerful poem. I think that the turn back, I've, I know a lot of clients who have done that and then it ends up being in their file and then the file is sent to them some way and then there it is. Right. It makes its way. <laughs> so it, it makes its way and then it messes with their head. Oh, I didn't know I weighed that much. Oh, should I do something? Should I be worried? Oh, I didn't know I had lost weight. Oh, I'm so good. How do I keep that weight off? Right. right? Yeah. Either yeah. way, it's a, it's a lose-lose. It is absolutely a lose-lose. Yep. That's and some people will say, yes, but, but I need to know the number because then I can sort of, you know, it, get, it helps me be in control. But if your relationship is based on a number – that's kind of random depending on the scale that you just got onto. Like that's not an authentic relationship with our body. That doesn't let you feel like, yeah, this is my body. Congratulations. I'm having a day where I'm more hungry. I'm having a day when I'm less hungry. I'm having a day when I'm a little bit, you know, bloated and feel a little bit fluffier. I'm having a day where I feel super, you know, strong and fit. I'm having a day where I feel like I want to move. I'm having a day when I want to rest. Right? It doesn't let us be in the conversation of how is our body right now? What do we need to do to feel good? It has us trying to do gymnastics metaphorically to keep ourselves around a specific number. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, um, you know, those are all those same thoughts that I've had. And, and it's just... Um, so difficult to work around some of that. So I think some of these examples that you're giving just make a lot of sense and, and help us to kind of rethink things a little bit and, and maybe how we can engage differently with.
I wondered if before we wrap up, if there are any other tools or advice or thoughts that you want to give to listeners in terms of how to achieve that bond. Yeah. So I think the way that I'd like to do that is actually share another um, poem of mine. And this is um, a client of mine said to me, when we were talking about how to really be in this, um, you know, kind and caring relationship with our body, she kept saying, I feel like I need to bathe in these words. And so I want to, I want to finish with that because I I think it can be really helpful to hear these words. Um, The poem's called, I need to bathe in these words. She said, I need to bathe in these words. They are new. They are unfamiliar. I don't yet know how to float and breathe and soak in these new words. Words that remind me that my body is lovable as it is. That my body is worth caring for instead of controlling. That my body is not a personal flaw. I'm so saturated in my body is wrong, the wrong shape, the wrong weight, the wrong cravings and desires. I've been swimming in shark infested waters that attack my cellulite, my wrinkles, my belly and my double chin. I've been wading in the murky end of the ponds and the leeches are sucking my self worth from me. I want to bathe in these new words of wholeness, enoughness, compassion. I need to hang out in the cool pool with the goddesses of every size, shape, and color. They nourish me. I need to bathe in these words. I need to absorb their wisdom into my cells. My body is worth caring for. I can find pleasure and joy in my body. My body is my sacred home. I am imagining that if I bathe in these new words, my body will flow instead of gasping in fear and regret. I need to bathe in these new words because they are healing waters. They are the truth. And so that's what I would want to leave people with is that, that it's possible. It's really possible if you're struggling with your body, if you're struggling with your relationship to food, to make a shift and to shift into a relationship that feels good, that, that where you feel at home, and not to wait, right? I work with women, you know, pretty much, you know, 35 and older, and I also, you know, and older up to women who are in their 80s who are saying to me, I don't want to die hating my body. Don't wait that long. Do the healing work now. It will change your life, and it will impact everybody in your circle, kids, nieces, nephews, everybody. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think you're right. Like we often hear of people, you know, that are older and they're sort of like, oh, I finally got there and I've just kind of given this up. And I think, oh, I wish I could have done that at 20. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I do feel like, you know, for everyone, the time is now like, don't, don't wait um, and and definitely appreciate your poem and and your thoughts around that. And even on our previous points around media and, and all of that and watching out, I know I'm constantly seeing things on Instagram where, you know, someone will point out how heavily Photoshopped things are. And um, I see a lot of the photos where people are like showing a posed photo versus a not posed. And I would just love if we could just only have the not posed photos all the time. Um, But, uh, you know, I think there are some things out there that can help us to start to see that, you know, maybe we're, we're a little bit being tricked by the media and, um, and influenced not in a great way. So I think, I think all of those are really important. Um. I'm sure listeners are going to want to find out more about you. This is such a, an interesting topic. And I think the way you approach it is just so appropriate. Um, I know you mentioned your website, bodypeacewithnina.com. Um, yeah. what, are, what are some of the other ways? So other ways to, 
connect with me. Again, there's the Practicing Body Peace Journal. There's also a free masterclass on my website, um, the Body Peace Masterclass. And it goes deeply into the different kinds of relationships that we have with our body, the mm. relationships that we've been, we've been taught by our culture and the relationships we really need to cultivate that we have no models for, that we need to cultivate to have be an example to our kids and also to feel good in our own body. So there's resources on my website and I'm also on all the social media channels as Mina Manelson. Um, so I invite you and I also have an app, Body Peace app. Oh, wow. That's great. And yeah. what is on the app? Is yeah. it um, the class and, and things like that as well? Yep. There's the, the master classes on the app. There's some programs you can join on the app, Body Peace Seekers. There's the Body Peace Starter Kit, which is a great way to start this process. It's a self-paced program. I also have different programs, the Compassionate Eating Course. I have Body Listening Lab. I have different long, uh, year-long groups for people who are really ready to do the deep healing and change this pattern for good, mm -hmm. um, which is the body peacekeepers. And so those groups are available as well and individual sessions as well. So there's a lot of resources to avail yourself of and a lot of ways to start this journey at whatever level you feel like if you feel like you're just tiptoeing your way in and you still have like one foot in Weight Watchers and one foot in like tiptoeing into body peace, there's resources. And if there's, you're like, you know what? I am so done. I've dieted for, you know, a gazillion years. I don't want to do it. I don't want to pass it on. I'm done, done, done. Then talk to me and let's figure out what a deeper, you know, bigger step that feels more supported that will really make a shift for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, that sounds great. Sounds like you're giving so much support to such a thing that a lot of people I think are working on. So that's wonderful. Well, Nina, this was great. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciated your time. You're so welcome. I love talking about this. I'm super passionate about it.